I was in my senior year of high school about 10 years ago. I grew up as sort of an outcast in high school. I wasn't bullied or anything, but I also didn't really have any friends. I didn't mind that solitary lifestyle though. I went through school and then would come home and play video games, and losing myself in those digital worlds was my escape. My home life wasn't what I would call bad either, it was just my dad and me. And I love my dad and he worked so much to provide for me. And when I was young, maybe 10 or 11 years old, my mom got involved with some bad people and their hobbies, if you know what I mean. My dad didn't want to expose me to that world anymore and we eventually moved away. It was messy, but it was for the best. He tried getting her help throughout the years, but she always turned it down. Until one day she was just off the grid, completely. It was sad, but we both moved on. And when I got older, he would have to leave for the weekend once a month for his job. I didn't mind though. It may seem crazy to some people to leave someone at that age home alone for a weekend, but my dad trusted me. One specific weekend during senior year when my dad left for the night, I started my normal routine. My pops would leave me some money to order a pizza and some soda. We never had soda in the house, so getting this two liter with a pizza was like a double treat for me. My night was beginning to play out just like every other night that I was home alone. I demolished the pizza and drank most of the soda, and after a little breather on the couch I went to my room and started playing some PlayStation. And this is how I would spend most of my weekends, even if dad was home. I would usually play Call of Duty, but Grand Theft Auto Online had just come out, so I had been spending some time playing that. And after a few hours of that, I decided to play the single player story mode, and the older I got, I seemed to play the story and games less, but for some reason on this night, I wanted to play something with some substance, even if it was GTA. And since I wasn't playing online anymore, I took my headphones off. As much as I game, I hate wearing headphones for long periods of time. I've been playing the story for a little while and I thought that I could hear something coming from downstairs. There weren't any loud or jarring noises, it was just these sort of small little vibrations and little bumps. Now I've been home alone a ton of times and I didn't remember ever feeling any of those vibrations or hearing any noises like that. But at the same time, the noises weren't alarming enough that I was actually freaked out. It was a little after one in the morning, and I think it's just subconscious to be a little on edge when you're home alone at that hour. And every few moments, I would hear a little scoffing noise. I'd pause the game and try to listen intently. When I listened, I would mostly just hear silence and maybe an occasional little bump. Just because I was home alone, of course, the quick thought of an intruder crossed my mind. I'm even embarrassed to say that at one point I even thought to myself, are ghosts real? But then I would immediately shoot that idea down. This little internal debate would continue for about 30 minutes. I finally paused the game and went over and sat in my computer chair to just straight up listen for a few minutes without trying to listen over the sound of gameplay. And the sounds started to happen more regularly. The sounds of the little bumps that I initially blamed on cracking pipes or house noises started to happen more often. The little vibrations I could feel were now happening almost every second. It was like my dad might be downstairs. The only thing missing was hearing his voice though. And the thought of my dad coming home early even crossed my mind, but he would have called me or at least poked his head in the room to see if I was awake. I decided that I was just kind of being paranoid and that I was getting myself all worked up for nothing. I decided I was going to go downstairs and check it out to prove to myself that nobody was in the house and that I was clearly just letting my imagination run away from me as the night ran on. I crept slowly down the upstairs hall and made my way to the top of the staircase. While I was slowly heading in the direction, the muffled sounds were much louder and I started fearing the worst. The thought of calling the police crossed my mind right away, but I was actually too anxious in that moment. In my mind, I was thinking to myself, what if nobody's here and I just waste the police time? And when I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw a light illuminating the dark walls coming from the other side of the house. It was the kitchen light. It's possible I left it on, but I'm fairly compulsive and I was nearly 100% certain that I had shut the light off before heading upstairs. I was practically crawling to the kitchen, I was moving so slowly. When I was only a few feet away from the kitchen doorway, I could hear the sounds of rummaging, like someone was going through my cabinets in the kitchen, 
and that was accompanied by a soft humming voice. And that hum, it was so eerie. I was half expecting to see some big scary burglar, but the voice indicated something else. I peeked my head into the kitchen, and in the corner, next to the sink, was a very small woman. Her hair was wild, kind of flowing in every direction, and I had my phone in my hand, ready to call the police, but I think that situation just had me frozen in terror, but also incredible curiosity. Then I realized the melody the woman was singing. She was humming, I got no strings to hold me down, from the Disney Pinocchio movie. And I almost fainted right there because I knew who this person was. It was my mom. She would always sing that to me when I was very young, and it was one of the only memories of my mother that I actually had left. I couldn't move, and I must have been trembling because she had heard me turning around. A big smile lit up her face, and even though it was my mom, this was not the mother that I remembered. Her teeth looked rotten, and her eyes looked like they were sunken into her face. In a voice that should have been soothing, but was somehow unnerving, she says, There's my baby. What are you doing awake at this hour? I didn't respond. I just stood there, like some statue. She came over to me, and put her dirty hand on my shoulder, saying, What am I going to do with your father? He's always changing out cabinets around. I swear that man doesn't listen. And then she started to laugh. But it wasn't charming. It was like some disgusting cartoon character laughing. And she turned back around and started humming and going through the cabinets again. I broke out of my trance and went to my room and locked the door. I then called the police and my dad right away. My dad made sure that I was in the bedroom with the door locked. He didn't go into details, but he said that there was a chance my mother might be dangerous and I needed to be safe just in case. The cops showed up and I heard a minor altercation. I could hear my mom yelling at the police to get out of her house. The police knew the situation from myself and my dad who called after me, and I heard a brief struggle and then silence for a few moments. I heard a cop shout my name and told me it was alright for me to come downstairs. I spoke with the police for a little while as another officer drove my mother away. One officer stayed parked outside of my house all night until my dad came home, just to help me feel safer, which I do really appreciate. My dad came home early the next morning and he spoke with one of the officers. I could tell by reading my dad's body language that he was uncomfortable and that we were potentially fortunate to avoid something horrible happening. My mother actually had two knives on her when she was apprehended. One knife she must have had when she broke in and the other knife was a sharp kitchen knife that belonged to my dad that she must have stuck in her pocket when she was in the kitchen. She never used them or even threatened to use them, but the fact that she had them was enough to freak me out. But maybe the most terrifying part of this horrible nightmare was that my mother had no idea where we lived. Well, she wasn't supposed to have any idea. When we moved away, we moved far away, and my dad never told my mom where we moved to protect me. She broke into the house by breaking one of the downstairs windows and crawling in. I didn't hear it at all, so it must have been when I had my headphones on or something. And I thought of my mom just humming and walking around downstairs, potentially waiting for my dad while I was upstairs and still freaks me out to this day. It's been about 10 years now and I've only seen my mother twice since that night. She has been in some type of institution for years now. She has no memory of that night, but in all fairness, she doesn't have much memory of anything at all. It's sad, but it's true. Every time I hear that stupid song from Pinocchio now, I sort of freeze up, and I just hope one day I can forget about the fear that I felt that night and find a way to remember my mom in a positive light. One thing that I hate almost more than anything in the world is being waited on. I don't mean at restaurants or places like that, I just mean in life in general. 
I've always been pretty independent, and when I first met my husband, we didn't click right away because we would literally fight over who was going to pay for the check. Fast forward to now, and we have a nice balance of things. One thing that I usually do is take care of the house, and even specifically the kitchen. I cannot stand a messy kitchen and dishes in the sink, and he's infamous for leaving dishes in the sink, so that's why I take care of the kitchen when I can. Now, a few weeks ago, I had to have surgery on my knee. This past summer, I destroyed my knee playing softball and still continue to finish the game doing more damage to my knee, and I put the surgery off for as long as I could, but the pain was too much. It wasn't even the procedure that I was anxious about. I actually wanted to just get it done and out of the way. I was more anxious that I was going to be practically bedridden for a little while. And my husband is amazing, and I knew that he'd take care of me, but I also knew that the kitchen was going to be a mess. I'm sure this makes me sound pretty controlling, but I don't even care. I just love making sure everything's clean. And the day came, the surgery passed, and in bed I was stuck, and I hated it. For me, it felt like I was trapped in a cell. I was told not to move for several days unless it was for the bathroom, and even then I should have assistance. Luckily, we had a bathroom in our bedroom, so it was only a few hops in case I needed to go. The first night, I stayed in bed, and the next day at home, I was already restless. I hopped to the bathroom, and when I was done, I realized that I was actually getting around pretty well. When my husband left for work, he begged me to stay in bed and that he would take care of the kitchen and dinner when he got home. All I could think about was that the kitchen was a mess. It didn't take me long to convince myself that I was alright to make my way there for a little while and just do the dishes. I took my time on the stairs because I will admit, it was not an easy task. When I got to the bottom, I smelled something strange. Not trash or old food that I was half expecting to smell coming from the kitchen. What I smelled was what I thought at first was sort of cheap cologne. But I know my husband doesn't even wear cologne. And then it hit me harder as I took a few more steps. It wasn't cologne. What I was smelling was Axe body spray. I knew it right away. When I was in middle school, all the teenage boys would spray themselves with it after gym class to mask the smell of the body odor. And I'll never forget that horrible smell. I took a few more hops. I know I should have had my walker at the time, and the smell was so strong that I felt like I could taste it. I knew my husband wasn't wearing that because I could have easily smelled it on him by now in our relationship. And I went to text my husband and said, Hey, don't get mad, but I actually hobbled downstairs. Why does it smell like Axe body spray here? After I sent it, I went to the kitchen, and I'll have to be honest. I was surprised. It wasn't a mess. There was a small plate and fork in the sink, and other than that, he was doing a good job at keeping the kitchen in line. I went over and washed a couple of the things in the sink and noticed that the back door, which is in the kitchen, was slightly opened. More a jar or crack than actually open, but it still wasn't shut. Maybe this isn't that big of a deal for some people, but we rarely, if ever, use that door. When we go out back, we usually go out the side door. We usually just keep that door locked and put the recycling bin in front of that door. And I sort of hobbled over to investigate some more, and I noticed that the bin had moved a few inches as well. It was like the door was open from the outside and the bin slid out of the way just enough to let someone in. I already knew the answer, but I texted my husband again anyway and said, Did you open the back door for any reason? He didn't respond right away. I hopped back into the living room and sat on the couch trying to put all the pieces together and put a rational spin on everything. The thought of someone breaking in didn't even remotely cross my mind because we lived in a really nice neighborhood with almost no crime ever. My husband called me back a few minutes later and told me that he had called the police just as a precaution to make sure nobody broke in and that he was heading home from work as well. I got off the phone with him and sat there quietly waiting for the police and my husband to show up. And then without noticing, bang. The closet door in the living room shot open. A tall man dressed in black ran out of the closet and out the back door. As soon as he ran by, that smell of axe was incredibly overwhelming. I tried hopping to the window, but I was only able to get a brief glance of the man as he ran by the side of the house. 
I noticed a very thick beard and that was pretty much it. He was out of my sight in seconds. Not long after the police showed up and then my husband right after. I gave them all the information I could but like I said, I didn't really have much to give to the police. The most disturbing part of all of this is that the cops are sure that the person didn't break into the house. There were no signs that he forced himself in which led the police to believe that whoever this intruder was, he may have had a key to the house. My husband went out right away and bought new locks for all the doors and made sure all the windows were locked as well. No other neighbors reported anything suspicious which makes it even more likely that this person targeted our house specifically. He also didn't steal anything which begs this question, what the hell did he want? If he wasn't swimming in Axe body spray and left that door cracked, whatever it is he wanted, he may have gotten. We've all had traumatic things happen to us in life. Some are much more serious than others, and when I was in high school, something traumatic and horrifying happened to me when I stayed overnight at one of my buddy's houses. His parents were going out of town on Saturday night to celebrate their anniversary. He invited me over to just kind of kick it and hang out for the night so he wasn't alone. We did invite a few people over, played some games, but ultimately everyone left around 11 or so. He and I hung out for a little while longer but then decided to lie down at around 2 in the morning. We were dozing off watching The Office when we heard a loud bang downstairs. I thought that it sounded like it was the door but my friend said that they thought it was a neighbor and just to ignore it, he was pretty tired at that moment. And now we were both on the verge of sleeping so we didn't overreact at first. Maybe it was just the neighbor. I mean, it could have been a bird hitting the house or something. And just as we convinced ourselves it was nothing to worry about, the knocks at the door started. Almost in a perfect rhythm, the bangs on the door echoed throughout the house. We had no idea at that moment what to do. This was clearly not a neighbor. This was real life, and there was someone knocking on the door at 2 in the morning. Every couple of seconds the knocks would come again. Sometimes they were harder and sometimes they were light knocks. It didn't matter what type of knock it was, just the thought that someone was standing out there at this hour was enough to scare us out of our wits. We both snuck over to one of the windows so we could catch a glimpse of the knocking person. It was just a normal looking man we saw. He didn't look like some addict, a criminal, or even just really sketchy. He literally looked completely normal. He was wearing what seemed to be a nice pair of sneakers, jeans, and had a nice sort of Nike polo shirt on that you might even wear going golfing. His hair was short and parted, but neatly groomed and he was clean shaven. Not exactly a scary individual, but still just so weird and so unsettling given the time. We both looked at each other in confusion, trying to process what was happening and trying to think of the correct way to handle this. And then he started to bang on the door again and we jumped down. Remember, this is two in the morning, so this could have been a Girl Scout selling cookies and it would have been unsettling. I was watching out the window while my friend was trying to call his parents. He was unsuccessful, but he kept trying. He wasn't smart enough to call the hotel or wherever they were staying, and the guy finally just walked away. But the relief was short-lived. Maybe 30 seconds later, he returned and taped a note on the front door. He didn't knock this time or anything, just left that note. He sat on the front steps for almost five minutes and then walked away. I kept looking outside, but I couldn't see him. We both decided that whoever this character was, he had to have been gone now. My friend went to unlock the door and I yelled at him to stop. He told me the guy was gone and that I had nothing to worry about anymore. He wanted to know what the note said and I'm not going to lie. I wanted to know what it said as well. My friend opened the door and grabbed the note and as he was pulling the tape off the door we heard a loud bellowing voice from the distance. Hey you! And we both froze and looked up. The knocking man came out of the bushes from across the street and started to charge at the door. We both screamed as we were shutting the door. 
and another large man came out of the bushes and followed the man from earlier. My buddy slammed the door and was fortunate enough to get it locked before they reached the door. Both men started to pound on that door, not knocking, pounding. I looked out the window and I saw the larger man who wasn't out there originally slamming his shoulder into the door. The bangs on the door were unrelenting and we started to fear the worst. Finally, my friend called the police and the guys outside must have heard what we were saying because they fled instantly. The police showed up and thankfully were able to get a hold of my friend's parents and they came home immediately. The worst part about all of this was the note that had been taped to the door. It was a very violent and detailed note about being at the house to pick up the money. I remember it saying things like, no more running around, no more excuses, and a bunch of other things like that. The note was signed with some name like Leroy. His dad denied everything and claimed and swore up and down that he had no idea who this Leroy was and what money he was talking about. I remember it being very weird and very uncomfortable around this family for a while until it was all sort of forgotten about. My friend and I never forgot about that night though, and we still talk about it to this day. I wondered to myself all the time if this dad was secretly up to something. I mean, the note addressed him specifically by name. They knew where he lived, and then after that night, nothing ever happened again. It just all seemed so weird. But I guess I don't know enough about the seedy underbelly of society to know if this is normal or not. We never got any more closure on that night, and trust me, I tried. One night, we pestered his dad for an hour trying to get information, and he just kind of rolled his eyes, saying that it just must have been some weirdo playing a prank, maybe. And whatever it was, it was a horrible night and a horrible memory that I'll always remember. And to this day, I still don't like being home alone. Let me first say that this story is a little depressing, and it makes me feel sad writing it, but it doesn't change the fact that this was one of the most frightening nights of my entire life. My father passed away when I was four or five years old. My mom met David when I was ten years old, and he ended up adopting me several years later. Even though David wasn't my real father, he raised me as if though I was his own daughter, and I loved him like he was my real dad. Scratch that. I hate the phrase, real dad. That man wasn't like a real father. He was my father. He was a great man and he treated my mother and me like we were the most important things in the world. A few months back, David passed away. He got sick suddenly and he died not long after. It was sad and it hit my mom really hard. He was old, but it didn't hurt any less. My elderly mother was already declining in her health and we were worried that this may be the final straw that broke her back. A few nights after the funeral, mom would call me in the middle of the night. Every time I thought, oh no, and figured the worst. It was bad, but not the type of bad that I thought. She was terrified. Two nights in a row, she called and claimed that someone was in her house. She could hear them moving around and she was incredibly scared. My husband and I felt horrible. On both days, we went over and searched the entire house and found nothing out of place. It didn't look like anybody broke in, nothing was stolen, and we triple checked that everything was locked up tight. On the third day, my mom begged me to stay overnight. This was if the intruder showed up again, I could witness and either stop them or call the police or something. Honestly, I just thought my mom was really tired and was dreaming and thinking her dreams were real or something. And at some point during the night, I thought that I heard someone or something coming from the dining room. It was jarring because it was clearly a voice. For a single second I thought my mom was right and people were breaking into the home. I slowly got off the couch and started to head toward the noise. I rolled out ghosts because I'm not really into any of that and I started to think that maybe it was someone homeless or something and they were squatting inside this elderly person's home. All these ideas were running through my head a million miles per hour as I was drawing closer to the noise. When I was only one room away, I could clearly hear the voice. It was my mom. I stopped sneaking at that point and walked into the dining room. 
My mom was sitting at the head of the table and having a full-blown conversation with nobody. It was the strangest thing I'd ever seen. Her eyes were wide open, but they were almost glazed over. She was awake and asleep, and she never looked in my direction, but she knew that I walked in. In a cheerful voice, she said, Hello, dear. I'm just enjoying some time with David. I looked over, and the chair next to her was slightly pulled out like my mom pulled it out for someone to sit in. I got closer to my mom, and her eyes were even more disturbing. It was like I could only see the white parts of her eyes, and mix that with her smiling and talking, and it was incredibly creepy. I tried to gently tell my mother that David passed away, and she just laughed and waved her hand in my face and said, You're so silly. David's sitting right here. I was at a loss for words. I didn't know the correct way to handle this. Do I just make my grieving an elderly mother happy and let her think that she's talking to her dead husband? Or do I try and wrangle her way back to reality and her crushing heartbreak? She grabbed my hand and still not looking in my direction or changing her facial features, she says to me, You can leave now, sweetie. I don't know why I was so scared. It was just David cleaning the house that I heard last night. It was just David. It was just David. I remember it word for word. She kept repeating that last part. The sleep talking turned into gibberish, and then every once in a while I would hear the name David slip out of her mouth. I didn't realize until that night just how hard my mother took the loss and how fragile her mind had become. When I tried to move my mother, she snapped and growled at me like she was some animal saying, Don't touch me, I'm talking to him. I called my husband and he met me over there and we decided to call 911 because we didn't know what else to do. When they tried to take her to the hospital, she became extremely hostile and even violent, not because we were taking her from her home, but because we were taking her from David. She kept saying that she wasn't allowed to leave because David wanted her there. The mind can truly conjure up anything when it's hurting, and my mother passed away not long after that night, God rest her soul. She never came back to herself after that night either. Her half-opened eyes and sleepwalking appearance never went back to normal. The doctors told me that she had some type of nervous breakdown and, due to her age, she couldn't separate reality from her mind. It really is so sad. When my biological father passed away, my mom was a wreck but buried those emotions to raise me. David saved her in so many ways, so when she lost him... It was like she lost nearly everything. I'm sorry if the story was a downer, but I'll never forget how my mother was acting that night. I'm a skeptical person, but a part of me almost believes that David was there with her. It's creepy, but the mind is an insane tool. Even just my mom thinking that the man was sitting with her freaks me out a little bit. And take care of yourself, folks. And tell your loved ones that you love them any chance you get. I think the word toxic is actually toxic and we throw the word around like it's some sort of frisbee. One topic that has always got brought up in that toxic conversation is toxic exes. Oh, how exes are terrible. Not all exes are bad though, but the ones that are, I think truly encompasses the word toxic. You see, I was engaged a few years ago and it ended very poorly. My fiancé got a job about a hundred miles from our hometown, so I moved with her and started a life here. I didn't have friends or family or anyone to turn to when we broke up, and because of the job I started, I decided not to head home just yet. It's not important how things ended, but they did end very poorly. She begged for me back, but I couldn't put myself through that heartache again. Right after the breakup, she kept the house, and I found a small one-bedroom apartment. I just hoped that I would be able to meet some new friends, which I am really bad at, by the way. A few weeks after the breakup, I was just sitting in the apartment sulking, which was my favorite hobby around that time. The apartment was on the first floor of the building, which was really like the half-basement, if that makes sense. My windows were at eye level, and it was just my head that was above ground. The rest of the apartment was below the ground. 
I had a lovely view of nothing to help me cope with my crippling depression at the time. One night while I was just sort of being a bum, the power went out. We were having a pretty bad storm, and last time we had a storm like this, the power was out for several hours. I knew I couldn't just sit in silence, and since it was getting late, I couldn't really go anywhere anyway, even though I probably wouldn't have if I could. I lit a few candles that I had and sat at my table. It was a small table that only fit two chairs. I loved to draw and color in high school, and I had some talent before I gave it up. This was the perfect chance for me to draw and just sort of get lost in something that I used to love so much. While I was drawing, trying to get my mind off of my ex, I heard something. It was a loud noise and it sounded pretty close. Unfortunately, it was too dark to see anywhere in my apartment other than the little area that I was sitting in with the candles. I slowly walked over to where I heard the noise and lying at my window outside was what looked like some sort of figure. I jumped back because I was scared even though I knew this had to be crazy. No one would break into this apartment. They would have to get on their stomach and practically crawl into the apartment, not to mention hardly anyone in this town knows even who I am. I went back to the small table and blew the candles out. This way I could use the darkness to my advantage and be able to see out the window better. I didn't know for sure what I saw at this point and it's possible that it could have been nothing. It could have even been a skunk or something trying to get out of the storm. I just didn't know. I went back over to the window and I could see it clearly now. This was no animal and this was not my imagination. Lying on the ground trying to open the window was a person dressed in all dark clothes. I freaked out. I didn't know what to do. The obvious answer was to call the police or the authorities or whoever, but I don't know why in the heat of the moment that just didn't cross my mind. The only person I really knew was my ex fiance and I decided to give in to my fear and loneliness and call her for help. And right as I pressed call, a light could be seen shining through the window, and a brief melody of a ringtone could be heard. The call went right to voicemail after that, I guess, and knowing what was most likely happening, I decided to call right back to see if it was a coincidence. And sure enough, the light and ringtone went off for a split second before the intruder shut it off. My ex was trying to break into my apartment, but why? At this hour, in this weather, her intentions were clearly sinister. I started to yell and she kept trying to break in through the window, but thankfully it remained locked. I called the police, and as soon as she heard me on the phone, I saw her get up and run off. I told the cops everything when they arrived. They actually didn't believe me right away and they looked almost annoyed like I was bothering them with this. But when they looked out the window, they could see the spot in the dirt where someone was lying, and there were clearly signs of forced entry. They finally agreed to follow up and see where my ex was. When the cops went and questioned her, she seemed to deny everything, which didn't surprise me. She said that she had been with her new boyfriend and that I needed to move on. This guy also vouched for her and said that she was at the house the entire night with him. Either this guy was in on it, or she was already manipulating him. I called her out for being a liar, and I was the one who was branded a liar and a crazy ex at the end of it. When I brought up that I called her twice and both times the phone lit up, she said that her phone was broken so it couldn't have been her. And this was it for me. I couldn't live in this town anymore, and now that I didn't feel safe being here either... I paid an early termination fee for my lease and I moved home to stay with my family until I got back on my feet. I've never heard from her again and I'm so thankful for that. My life is much better without that toxic human ruining my life. Being stalked in the night is horrifying. I've read and heard enough stories over the years that I am almost desensitized to the notion of being stalked. I say that now, but I'm sure if I was being chased by some crazy man that I would probably jump out of my skin. I will say, though, that I know firsthand what it's like to be potentially staring death in the face. And that, my friends, is the most terrifying thing on the planet. It's not always the knife-wielding maniac you need to be afraid of, trust me. 
Last year, I decided to rent this little cottage that was practically in the middle of nowhere. I don't love people and I hate the city, so I just wanted to get away and live in nature for a little while. Listen to the trees, the wind, and the wildlife, and this place was adorable, and its wilderness location was perfect. I was in the mountains, but I still had all the afternoon sun. It was as close to heaven as I've ever been. Up in these parts, it's not uncommon to see wildlife come near your cottage, like deer or even bear in some cases. A few weeks ago, a couple of bears came and actually tried to get some food out of my cottage, but they were unsuccessful. I wasn't scared, I was actually excited. I got some cute videos that I'll be able to enjoy for the rest of my life. However, one night at the cottage, things got bad. I may have accidentally drank a little too much, and as a result, I passed out on the recliner, which was in the main room of the cottage. Just to give you an idea of the size of this place, it was a small kitchen, much like you would find in a typical apartment. Then it was just one main room with a recliner, a small chair and table, and a bed in the back. On the back side was a little bathroom with a walk-in overhead shower. In other words, two people could not live in this cottage. And because I had drank too much, I forgot to lock the door, which wasn't a huge deal because this place was in the middle of nowhere. It was more so a comfort thing that I like to lock the door. It doesn't matter where I am, I just like the idea of the door being locked while I'm asleep. Well, my nightmare was about to come true because I woke up to the sound of things smashing and breaking coming from the kitchen, which was where the door to the cottage was located. I thought I was being punished for the one time in my life that I didn't lock the door, and just my luck that I would have an intruder in the middle of nowhere. I grabbed my pocket knife and snuck to the doorway, and let me tell you, I wish it was an intruder, but let me rephrase that, I wish it was a human intruder. In the kitchen, going nuts, digging through the trash and the food that I had in the fridge, was a fully grown mountain lion. Its tail whipping back and forth, it was making this horrible, guttural, growling noise. I don't know if it was a good enjoyment sound, or this thing was ready to rip my face off. Either way, I didn't want to take that chance. I jumped back on the other side of the wall and tried to figure out how I was going to escape this situation. In the little bathroom was a small window that I was sure that I could climb out of, but I was too scared to make any noises for fear that this giant cat would hear me. The more the mountain lion growled, the more scared I became. I finally made a run for the bathroom. The cat heard me. And do you want to hear something scary? YouTube the sound of a mountain lion growling. Now imagine that just a few feet away from you. It was one of the worst things I've ever heard. As I ran to the bathroom, I slid the door shut, and I heard the mountain lion jump into the main room. Of course, the bathroom didn't have a real door and just had one of those sliding doors. I was holding it tightly as I could, trying to think of a way out of this predicament. While I was holding the door, the mountain lion started to ram its head or something into the door. I was screaming, which I'm sure was making the cat even more tense. And for once, the small bathroom came in handy. I was able to hold the door shut with one hand and reach across to open the window. I didn't care about the deposit, so I kicked out the screen and in one foul swoop I dove out the window. As soon as I let go of the door, the mountain lion was able to open the door and all I remember seeing was this vicious looking head growling as I tried to jump out the window, but it couldn't or didn't, and I ran to my car, which was thankfully unlocked and got in the car and locked the doors. I didn't have my keys, so I couldn't drive anywhere, but at least I could lock the doors. I did actually eventually see the mountain lion come out of the cottage about an hour later and walked around the car for a while. That scary cat continued to make these low, guttural sounds and even bared its teeth at times. At around dawn, the mountain lion finally retreated somewhere and was gone for a while before I left the car. I rushed into the cottage and the place was destroyed. I grabbed my keys and my phone and drove into town. I called the property owner and the guy somehow laughed. I just had the worst night of my life with an animal that I thought was going to rip my throat open and this guy was laughing and basically just telling me, yep, that can happen around here. And in case you couldn't tell, I left that day. 
And yeah, I had to pay for the damages because you gotta love those contracts. But needless to say, nature is no joke. That was undoubtedly the worst experience of my life, and I wouldn't wish that on anyone except maybe that property owner. I'm just kidding. And I've since found a boyfriend, and I gotta be honest, I don't love being alone anymore. Maybe I'm getting older. Maybe this experience rocked me to my core. The only thing I can say for absolute certainty now is that I am most definitely a dog person. So people can be very weird. We can even affect people that we never even notice. It just blows my mind some of the thoughts that run through other people's minds. And I'll tell you my story and you'll know what I mean. And at the time, I was working a ton. I was saving money to buy my girlfriend a ring. And spoiler alert, we're married now. We were renting a small house, but still better than the apartment because at least we weren't sharing walls. I was also saving money so we could buy a house. She was also saving money for the same reason. Since I was working so much, she decided to volunteer for a five-day retreat with the company she worked for. She would get paid a ton of overtime and this allowed me to work overtime at my job, even more than I already was doing. I was going to miss her, but it seemed like a great opportunity to bring home some extra cash, especially with the holidays rapidly approaching at the time. On Wednesday, when I left for work, I noticed a weird smell in my car. Not a bad smell, just a very strange one. It was sort of like a perfume, but one that a younger girl would wear. Some thoughts crossed my mind, but I eventually just threw it up to some weirdness that I didn't understand, and honestly, I didn't care much either. It was just small after all. And that night, I had a horrible time sleeping. I told myself it was most likely because I missed my girlfriend. I was always used to her being there, and now this was the third night in a row that I was sleeping alone. I swore that I could hear noises all night long coming from downstairs, but it wasn't loud enough or scary enough to sort of raise any alarm bells, so again, I ignored the weird signs and told myself that it was probably just house noises or the wind. Thursday morning arrived and I felt like I hadn't slept at all. I made my coffee and hoped that it would do the trick soon. When I got to the car, I found it unlocked. I'm good about locking the car door, but I had been working a lot and the thought of forgetting to lock the door was on my mind. Ignoring the unlocked door, I got into the car and started to drive to work. Now same story as the previous day, I could smell that perfume again. And now some red flags were raising, but I couldn't even begin to think about what could possibly be going on. Every thought I had ended with me blaming it on myself for being overtired or missing my girlfriend. It was the most logical explanation, at least to me at the time. I left work that evening and once again the smell in my car was clearly perfume. I even had a coworker come over and smell my car just to make sure that I wasn't being delusional. He said that he could clearly smell it too. It was probably just my girlfriend's perfume and because I missed her, I'm starting to subconsciously notice certain smells that I may have gone nose blind to. I knew the smell of her perfume and I knew that it wasn't it. But what he said seemed kind of logical and that I just assumed he was correct. Maybe my senses of smell were changing. And when I got home, again all I could smell was that perfume and now I was really weirded out. I kept trying to convince myself that my coworker was correct but it wasn't working. I decided to take a shower and go grab some food and a drink at the bar just to sort of unwind. My girlfriend was coming home the next afternoon, and it was also my first day off in 13 days, so I was ready to relax. I got home late that Thursday night, and maybe at around midnight, and got myself ready for bed. That smell hit me as soon as I opened the door to the house. I was more annoyed at this point than anything else. I was never scared, it was just so weird that it bothered me. I got into bed not long after getting home and started to fall asleep. I knew that she was coming home tomorrow, so I was hoping all the weird smells would go away. I must have fallen asleep for a little while because I was awoken by someone getting into the other side of the bed. For a second, I thought it was my girlfriend. I was half asleep and my mind just went right to her. As she was getting into bed, she shushed me and I turned back around. She started to cuddle up to me like she was the big spoon, which she had never done before. 
but I was so tired and so happy that she was home that I didn't even care. Maybe a minute later, my eyes shot open. I looked down, and a woman's forearm was lying across my body, holding me. I smelled the arm, and I instantly recognized the perfume. This was not my girlfriend. Then I started to come to my senses, and I remembered that she wasn't coming home until the afternoon. Why would she have come home in the middle of night? I jumped out of bed, freaking out. I turned the lights on, and just sitting in my bed was some young girl, probably in her mid-twenties. She was smiling and kept brushing her hair away from her face. She kept asking me what was wrong and calling me babe. I was screaming for her to get out of my bed, but she just kept smiling. I called the police, but she didn't even react. She started to shush me again, and she kept trying to rub my arm. The entire time I was freaking out and telling her that the cops were coming, but she didn't seem to care. She didn't look crazy or anything, she looked like a pretty normal girl. She was also dressed in a very small and low-cut piece of nightwear, and when she got out of bed to try and console me, she put on a low-cut fluffy robe. The cops showed up, and I immediately went to them pleading my case, and the woman just sat there, letting me do this. She wasn't armed, she hadn't tried to hurt me, and there had been no issues with the law prior or anything I later heard. She was just some girl. The cops take her out, and she says in some weird calm voice to me that she loves me, saying that she'll be back and that this is just a misunderstanding. My heart is going a hundred beats a second, but after some investigating, it turns out this woman was our neighbor on the street we lived on. She was a quiet girl, so quiet that I didn't even know that she existed on the same street. And while she lived at this house, she developed some obsession, sort of an infatuation with me. When she noticed my girlfriend hadn't been around for a few days, she started to break in, and the poor girl convinced herself that I was in love with her. Through all of this, she was never dangerous, and thankfully that was the case because who knows what would have happened if she actually meant me harm. But even though the woman meant no harm, it doesn't make the situation any less creepy. I had a borderline stalker living in my house for almost a week, and she got into my bed with me. She never returned to her house, and we moved shortly after that anyway. From what I understand, she had family, and the family was notified, and last I knew, she was being treated for some type of illness. I'm not sure what it was, so forgive my ignorance, but now do you know what I mean when I say people are weird? You just truly never know what could happen. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, sticking out your get for the Rizzler. You're so skibbity.